In this video, we are going to continue looking at ways to create epoxide products. And here we'll be focusing on base promoted halohydrin cyclization. As a reminder, halohydrins are molecules that have a hydroxy group and a halogen. And generally for purposes of this reaction, we're referring to as an essential component that the halogen X and the hydroxy group be on adjacent carbons. In other words, the hydroxy group and the halogen have to be vicinal to one another. So we're really talking here about base promoted vicinal halohydrin cyclization. So let's go ahead and take a closer look at this particular reaction. When we think about this particular reaction, we first need to review what we learned earlier in the chapter, because we're going to be drawing parallels to this. And that essential review is that in the Williamson ether synthesis, what we were doing was taking a metal alkoxide, we were at R bonded to an oxygen, that oxygen was an anion because there was a metal counter ion in there. And the oxygen anion would come in and attack the primary carbon of an alkyl halide in an SN2 type reaction so that as the lone pair electrons from the oxygen came in and attacked the primary carbon, the leaving group X would break away to create a new carbon oxygen bond of the ether. So for the reaction that I've just shown here where we created the new carbon oxygen bond that I'm highlighting in red, we would refer to this as an intermolecular reaction based on the way we've written it out because the two reactants are in totally separate molecules. So we call this intermolecular and that is where two molecules are reacting with one another. And it could actually be two or more molecules, but the point is that the reactivity is occurring between these two separate compounds and they're joining together in the final product. The reaction that we're going to learn about here is thought of as the intramolecular equivalent of this Williamson ether synthesis, where what we will do in this reaction where we're converting halohydrins into epoxides is that we will start with a halohydrin which I'm showing X as a halogen, my hydroxy group here. I'll put the lone pairs in because we're gonna show some mechanism going on here. And then we will treat that with a base, sodium hydroxide, for example. That base will come in and as bases do, it will grab a proton from the most acidic location of the molecule, which is going to be this proton right here on the oxygen. Oxygen hydrogen bond breaks and the electrons go onto the oxygen. And that will give us this situation where we will have an oxygen anion situated vicinal to the chlorine or other halogen atom right here. And so now what we're set up for is essentially an intramolecular Williamson ether synthesis. So I'm going to label this as an intramolecular reaction. And the intramolecular reaction versus inter that we saw above in the intramolecular reactions is where one molecule reacts with itself. So in other words, one molecule is equipped with both of the functional groups necessary for the reaction. And so the reaction doesn't involve two different molecules coming together and reacting. Instead, it's all done in-house. It's all done within this single individual molecule. And so thinking about the analogy to the Williamson ether synthesis, in Williamson ether, we had an oxygen anion. We have an oxygen anion down here as well with our deprotonated halohydrin. And likewise, analogous to what we had up top where we had an alkyl halide, we have an alkyl halide group here. We have a carbon bonded to that oxygen. And so what happens in this intramolecular Williamson ether type reaction is that the oxygen anion is nicely situated to come over and attack 
the electrophilic carbon that's bonded to the halogen. When that happens, the leaving group breaks away. And so the electron pushing arrows that we're seeing here for our deprotonated halohydrin reaction are analogous to those we're seeing up top for the Williamson ether synthesis in that you have the oxygen acting as a nucleophile attacking the electrophilic carbon as the leaving group leaves. So we can really think of this as an intramolecular SN2 type reaction that is occurring here. And so as a result of this reaction, our final product will correspond to having that epoxide group in place because the oxygen came in and formed the new covalent bond that I'm highlighting in pink here in our final product. So now that you've seen this reaction, you might be asking yourself, can this same type of reaction be used in order to create not just epoxides, but larger ring ethers as well? So we saw several cyclic ethers previously that were part of rings. And yes, this same type of strategy can be used to create ethers that have rings. For example, if our target, meaning the molecule we're trying to create, was THF, tetrahydrofuran, which is a five-membered ring with an oxygen atom, we could create that product via the reaction of a molecule that had a total of four carbon atoms in its chain, because there's four carbon atoms in our final product here, so one, two, three, four. So we can make a four-atom carbon chain. So we have four carbons in our chain. At one end of that chain, we have a hydroxy group. At the other end of that chain, we have a chlorine atom. And what will happen is when we treat this with base, the base comes in, it will deprotonate this oxygen atom. So we'd have oxygen anion at the end. Once that deprotonation has taken place, the oxygen would come over, attack the electrophilic carbon as the leaving group leaves. And you would end up with a four carbon ring, one, two, three, and I'm missing a carbon atom, so I need to go back and add one to my chain here. So adding a carbon atom to my chain so that I have four carbon atoms in this group here, and then I need to edit this just a little bit to make my electron pushing arrow go all the way over to the electrophilic carbon. So it comes over to the electrophilic carbon leaving group leaves. This is why I always recommend counting your carbon atoms and double checking your work here to make sure that everything makes sense in terms of the number of carbon atoms that you would expect to end up in the ring. So we have one, two, three, four carbons in our starting material, one, two, three, four in our product. And we have connected the oxygen atom from the hydroxy group with our electrophilic carbon. That would be the bond which we would see in the molecule right here to create this ring as the leaving group leaves in this SN2 type reaction. So this particular reaction of taking halohydrins, if we're making epoxides, it has to be a vicinal halohydrin. So I'll add that little annotation up here that it's gotta be a vicinal halohydrin to make epoxides. Other halohydrins that aren't vicinal can be used to create ethers where the ether group is part of a ring. And it all goes back to this Williamson ether type synthesis where we deprotonate an alcohol to create a hydroxide oxygen anion that is very nucleophilic and eager to attack the primary carbon that is bonded to a leaving group. And in the case of the epoxide synthesis, this situation works out nicely because the Oxygen is in such close proximity here in the middle of the screen, what I'm highlighting and laser pointing to come right over and form a covalent bond to the carbon. So in this reaction, we're asked to predict the major organic products of this reaction series, including the configuration. For this reaction, you will have to remember some of the information that you learned back in organic chemistry one. Namely, in this particular reaction, we're starting with an alkene. We react with chlorine and water and this is the reaction that we learned back in chapter um, eight or so, which was the formation of halohydrins by adding water and a halogen across a carbon-carbon double bond. And so this first reaction here 
if we want to categorize these, is an addition reaction to yield a vicinal halohydrin. And this is a very common way to go about creating epoxides in this approach because in creating epoxides via this approach, um, it's often not possible to purchase the particular halohydrin that you want to use as your starting material, but the corresponding alkene is commercially available. And so we start from the alkene that's readily available, convert it into a halohydrin ourselves, and then treat with base to carry out that Williamson ether type synthesis reaction where we convert the halohydrin into the epoxide group. And in this reaction, I am going to um, consider the configuration or the stereochemistry of the reaction for both of the steps, because ultimately we need to predict the configuration of the final products, and that requires knowing what the intermediates are going to look like along the way. So we start with the first part of this reaction is our halohydrin formation. And what you should remember about halohydrin formation is that if the atoms around the alkene are restricted in rotation once the carbon-carbon single bond forms due to the fact that there's a ring here, that the addition that occurs here is an anti-addition, meaning that the hydroxy group and the chlorine are going to add anti to one another. They're going to add to opposite faces of the molecule. And so we need to keep that in mind, that the hydroxy group and the chlorine will end up adding anti to one another. The other thing we need to keep in mind here, in addition to that stereoselectivity, is we need to keep in mind the regioselectivity as well. That is, will the hydroxy group add here at the less substituted carbon, or does the hydroxy group add at the more substituted carbon? Well, the rule going back to the materials from organic one is that the halogen is going to add to the less alkyl substituted carbon. and the hydroxy group adds to the more alkyl substituted carbon. And so if that's seeming a little bit unclear or a little, a little cloudy or fuzzy to you, um, you may want to go back and take a look again at chapter eight from org one to refresh on these addition reactions, um, specifically the halohydrin formation reaction. So in general, the halogen is going to add to the less substituted carbon, hydroxy group to the more substituted carbon. So that means that we need to plug the hydroxy group in right here. And the halogen is going to go right here on our less substituted carbon like so. And then keeping in mind that this is anti-addition, what that means for us is that the two groups are going to be trans. So I'll put the hydroxy group on a dash, chlorine on a wedge. And then we also need to create the enantiomer in the stereoselective reaction. So in the enantiomer, what we will do is flip the configuration. So our methyl group we can put on a dash to illustrate that the wedge became a dash. And then additionally, we can put the hydroxy group onto a wedge. And the chlorine then goes on a dash to illustrate that its configuration has been inverted between these two structures. So these two compounds that I'm circling with my laser pointer are related as enantiomers. They are both anti because they have the hydroxy group and chlorines trans to one another. So then from there, now that we've created the organic product of our first reaction in the series, then comes the second part of the reaction where we react with the base. And what we recognize the base will do, it is, it is going to grab the proton from our hydroxy group in each of these cases, then the hydroxy group oxygen anion is gonna come down and attack the electrophilic carbon chlorine bond as that carbon chlorine bond breaks. And so we can show that in an abbreviated way by indicating that this hydrogen atom is no longer there we assume that the deprotonation has taken place. So I'm not drawing out a full mechanism here. I'm just scribbling out some things to help myself in coming up with the logical product of the reaction.
So again, this is not a complete mechanism. This is just uh, trying to skip over some steps to make sure that I'm drawing out the product correctly in this shortcutty kind of way. So we've gotten rid of the proton that was on the on our alcohol group. And now we've created this oxygen anion that's gonna come in acting as a nucleophile. It attacks the electrophilic carbon here as the leaving group leaves. Same thing with the enantiomer. Nucleophilic oxygen comes in, attacks the electrophilic carbon. As the leaving group leaves, this is an SN2 type reaction. And thinking about the stereochemistry of that, what will always be the case is that the nucleophile on an SN2 has to come in from the side opposite where the leaving group is leaving. So if the leaving group is leaving as a wedge, like in this left-hand um, scenario here that I'm circling with my laser pointer, that means that the oxygen has to come in as a dash. It has to come in from the face opposite where the leaving group is leaving. Then over here on the right, since the chlorine is leaving as a dash, that means that the oxygen has to be coming in as a wedge. It's coming from the opposite face of the molecule. And so as a consequence of that, we can go ahead and draw out our products of this, including the configuration, by showing either two dashes coming to the oxygen, because the oxygen in the left-hand side here was already a dash. So that's going to stay a dash in the product. And then the other bond that makes the epoxide, our red um, electron pushing area here, would have to be a bond that's forming as a dash as well, since the chlorine's leaving as a wedge. So that makes these two groups on the same face of the molecule. And then our methyl group, don't forget to plug that in, still going to be a wedge because nothing happened at this particular chiral center that I'm circling in the reactant here. So that's going to stay the same. Then the other organic product here would be the enantiomer of that or the candidate enantiomer of that where the bond to the methyl group is a dash, the bond to the oxygen is a wedge, and the bond between oxygen and carbon that we just made based on the red electron pushing arrows would also be a wedge. So I'll go ahead and draw that in as well. So drawing a wedge and a wedge to my oxygen atom here of the final product. And then it's important to ask yourself, when you draw these structures, make sure that you haven't drawn two structures that are totally superposable because sometimes there can be symmetry in the molecules and things that will lead you astray in thinking that there's two different stereoisomers when there actually isn't because the two are totally superimposable. But in this case, these two are different structures. They are different enantiomers because of the fact that there's no way that you could rotate either of these structures around to make them totally superposable with one another. And so therefore, the major organic products, including configuration, would be these two structures. And so what we've highlighted in this example problem is that as you're going through and trying to predict the organic products, including the configuration, you have to be mindful about not only what's happening in this final step of the reaction to invert the configuration via SN2, but also along the way, what are the stereochemistry constraints that are introduced by this halohydrin formation reaction? And this will be a really common way that you will see these types of reactions taking place is that we start with an alkene, we create our own vicinal halohydrin, and then do our nucleophilic substitution. And SN2 reactions always have that inversion of configuration, which is really what we're showing here is that the nucleophile comes in opposite the face the leaving group is leaving. So in summary, with all of this in mind, you should now be comfortable with predicting the major organic products of taking an alkene, converting it into a halohydrin, and then making that halohydrin into an epoxide. You should also be comfortable with starting from a halohydrin, if it's a vicinal halohydrin, to create an epoxide product by treating with base, or if it's a non-vicinal halohydrin, treating with base to create an intramolecular reaction that gives a larger ether ring in the product. You should also be comfortable with writing out the mechanisms for all of the reactions that we have talked about today from the formation of the halohydrin onward to converting halohydrins into epoxides.